size. <coughs> now, we can derive the same thing for a lens. You remember that as light comes into a lens, we have to apply Snell's law twice to calculate how the ray bends. Um, and remember with the lens, there's a complication that we're assuming that we can apply the paraxial approximation at each surface of the lens when we derive our ray matrix theory. And the paraxial approximation, of course, says that for small angles, theta in radians approaching zero, or theta in degrees approaching zero, that theta is equal to the sine of theta is equal to the tangent of theta. And this, of course, is true in radians and not degrees, but if you plot the angle in degrees, you see out to about 30 degrees, it's a pretty good assumption. And below 10 degrees, the paraxial approximation is a really good assumption. Um, so let's get an idea of how this would work. If we happen to have a ray of slope 0 coming in, we see that it bends in the ray and is going to go through the focus. Of course, how much the bending is is going to be dependent upon the position with larger R values coming in having a larger slope. So you can see that a thin lens, a perfectly thin lens or ideal lens matrix, has to somehow relate the position to the slope. Um, and if you run through the math on this, and your book does it, so I'm not going to go through the whole derivation, the, the matrix for the ray looks essentially like that. And that's the ABCD matrix. Of course, this makes sense because the output position from this point to this point are essentially the same and don't depend on the slope, while the slope is both the function of the input position and the input slope. <clears throat> a question is, how do we combine ray matrices if we have a system? So let's take this system right here, where our input plane is defined to be right there, and our output plane is defined to be right here, and this system is composed of essentially three separate elements. Um, space, followed by a lens, followed by a second space, D2. How do we go about calculating this? Well, it's a pretty straightforward process because all we have to do is calculate the effect of the first element of our system, which is going to be the space D1. So I can write the matrix for that, 1, D1, 0, 1. Um, then once I solve this, I can multiply by the next matrix, and that's going to be my lens, 1, 0, minus 1 over F, 1. Notice I'm multiplying two matrices together in a reverse order. The input matrix, or the, element, the matrix of the element closest to the input plane, comes last. And remember that it's important to have the right order when you're multiplying matrices. If you reverse the order of these matrices, the answer would not be correct. And of course, I then need to include this for my final element, which is 1, D2, 0, 1. And if I multiply all these matrices together, I'll find out what the output plane of the system is. So what we've done is, by applying simple ideas of geometry, we've developed a working model of ray matrices that we can apply to optical systems. Um, if you use Newtonian or Gaussian optics, um, they essentially tell you, for some particular position, all the rays that start from an object point are going to meet again to form an image. It's a massively parallel approach, but they tell you nothing about what the rays are doing at points in the system. They're not object or image points. And it's a very useful approach for calculating image positions and magnifications. Ray matrices tell you the position and slope of a single ray, because you have to specify the starting position and the starting slope at any single plane. So it's a serial thing. You can calculate a lot of information about a single ray, but you have to do it one ray at a time. It's very flexible, um, but, and it's well suited to doing calculations using computers. So to review, essentially what we say is we have an input plane, we have an output plane, with some type of optical system in between them that we treat as a black box. We essentially have an input position, R, and an input slope, R prime, which is the tangent of the angle the input ray makes to the system, and similarly an output position R out, and an output slope R prime, and we assume that the angles of propagation theta at any point in the system follow the proxial approximation. So if theta is given in radians, 
the sine of theta is approximately, the tangent of theta is approximately equal to theta. Um, the output slope and position are related to the input slope and position by the system matrix that is a two by two matrix called the ABCD matrix. It has a form that looks like that. And if we know the optical elements of the system, spaces and lenses and other types of elements for which matrices exist, we simply multiply them in order from the last matrix close to the output plane, element by element, all the way to the input plane. And that gives us the system matrix. And no matter how many two by two matrices we multiply together, we're always going to end up with a two by two matrix that fully describes the optical system given the praxial approximation. So it's a very powerful approach. And we'll be using this in many different applications as the course progresses.